Joseph and Wolf Lebovich, Chair of Jewish Studies at the University of Waterloo, and former Director of the University's Friedberg Geniza Project. He holds a PhD in Religious Study and Medieval Jewish Thought from the University of Toronto, and an LLM from New York University's Law School. His primary areas of study include Biblical exegesis and hermeneutics, Medieval Jewish Thought and Philosophy, Maimonides and Rabbinics. His most recent book is Maimonides and the Shaping of the Jewish Canon, which came out in Cambridge in 2014. Please. Uh, thank you, uh, Rishon. Uh, you are CT Marsh as the Schut Gadol Bishvili, the Trom Mashu who Lefne Kahal Chubad Kazeh, Afshar Hamashu Shali, the Yesh for Mashasha, Kamosh Shemani Wechmo, all of that Kamosh Mash Omrim Batel Bashisha. Second of all, I'd like to thank um, the organizers. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Juni for all her uh, work on this. And um, Svi, for all his work in organizing it. Um, and I want to say just a couple of words um, about perhaps the central figure that makes all this possible and that has uh, resuscitated Kinesis studies and allowed it to thrive for the future. That is my friend, my teacher, uh, my Chavrusa, uh, Albert Dove Friedberg. Uh, it is a rare uh, event, I think pretty well unheard of, that the patron <coughs> of the Academy, one of the patrons of scholarship, himself has advanced the scholarship that he's a patron of uh, in very considerable ways. I think that's an un almost an unheard of um, event. And uh, I can imagine that a couple of hundred years from now, uh, like uh, studies on Firkovich, the new Firkovich studies, somebody <laughs> will be doing a PhD on who was Albert Friedberg. On the one hand, we see from these documents that uh, he had a relationship and correspondence with Rav Shach, uh, with Rosh Yeshiva. Uh, and on the other hand, he has correspondence with Chagai Ben Shammai and biblical <laughs> scholars. Who was this man, Albert Friedberg? So, um, so I'd like to thank him as well. <laughs> so now you can start my time. <laughs> um, I want to uh, talk about, uh, there are three points that um, Aviram in his very, very fascinating paper, and, and, and of course his, his beautiful uh, published paper on Tfisat HaLashon Barambam. Three points, that is, generally Maimonides' theory of language and of course its Aristotelian Greek roots. Um, and then um, particularly how his philosophical considerations shape halacha, an issue that has exercised uh, a number of people. And then finally, I think his most important contribution, which he ended off with, is the kind of question that must be asked when we approach this issue. And that is the right question, as he said, is not which ruling do the Talmudic sources necessitate, but rather what rulings do the Talmudic sources enable. enable. And so um, what I'd like to do here is simply um, uh, offer a few remarks generally about the importance of language in Maimonides' philosophical project, and then move to one particular example that has been cited before, but I might have just a little bit more to say about it that I think highlights the right question that uh, Aviram asked. Maimonides' entire philosophical project, which is essentially a hermeneutical one, is anchored in how he perceives language, and particularly the sacred, holy tongue, Lashon HaKodesh, of Hebrew. Much of the first part of the guide <coughs> is taken up with language and building a lexicon, which will instruct the reader primarily to correct readings of the Bible. In other words, Maimonides' project is essentially to present a certain view of language that will ultimately enable a coherent philosophical reading of what is patently a philosophically offensive text. Maimonides therefore primarily aims at preserving the Bible's consistency with preconceived philosophical conclusions that have been demonstrated as true. The guide's purpose is wholly linguistic in this sense and is not intended as a philosophical treatise per se, aimed at working out correct philosophical conclusions. On that score, Aristotle, barring some disagreements here and there, and even where those disagreements seem patent, might actually not be disagreements, like on creation, for the most part, preceded Maimonides doing an excellent job. The existential philosophical and theological crisis Maimonides intellectually sophisticated Jewish adherents confront that challenge his or her faith is really a crisis of language. 
how can he handle the philosophically offensive nature of the, quote, externals of the law, which speak falsely about God, and therefore in a language that actually undermines all the metaphysical truths they and Maimonides hold dear. True to this vision of Torah, the guide's express agenda is linguistic, primarily, quote, to explain the meaning of certain terms occurring in the books of prophecy, and secondarily, to offer, quote, the explanation of very obscure parables occurring in the books of the prophets, but not explicitly identified there as such, end quote. The guide advises its reader at the very outset that any chapter that does not patently deal with biblical terms does so implicitly as ancillary to others which do, or by obliquely hinting to a term intentionally suppressed for the time being. Such chapters seemingly devoid of biblical reference might also, quote, explain one of the parables, or, quote, hint at the fact that a certain story is a parable. The guide then, in its entirety, purports to be about language. It could have just appropriately been titled, and here I think Heschel might be right, that Maimonides was a prophet, because he did not call his book How to Read the Bible. I looked at, at a catalog recently in the library, and I found 15 titles, in addition to Jim Kugel's book, How to Read the Bible, that are also called How to Read the Bible. So luckily he didn't call it that. It would be a hard time to find it. What stimulated Maimonides' disciple, Rabbi Joseph, the private addressee of the guide, was, as Maimonides reminisces about their student-teacher relationship, Joseph's longing to, citing Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, find out acceptable words and record generally truth. Not only is language a primary concern of the guide as a whole, it also is the motivating factor on a private personal level for composing it in the first place. The quest for acceptable words, the rechefetz, when reading the Bible, remains as relevant to 21st century adherents as it did to its 12th century adherents. By citing this verse, Maimonides already reveals what his methodology will be by looking at its original context and the method pioneered by Shlomo, the traditional author of Ecclesiastes. The previous verse reads, And besides that Kohelis was wise, he also taught the people knowledge. He pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. Solomon subjected parables, Mishalim, to close scrutiny, Izain v'chikir, in order to teach the people knowledge, Limei da'at et ha'am. That is precisely the key Maimonides offers to biblical language, metaphors and equivocal terms that comprise parables. Deciphering those parables is the means to teaching da'at, knowledge. Joseph's own striving for divrei chefetz draws him into that camp of the rare breed of person who Maimonides, in the introduction to his Yudgimel Karim, 13 Principles of Faith, includes in a third category of people who he considers his only qualified audience. They are those, and remember, this is his introduction to the Yudgimel Karim. These are the people, the only people that he cares about or that should listen to him. They are those who appreciate the malleability of language as opposed to those who cannot get past the literal exterior, they don't understand language. They don't understand the semantics uh, of language. And either believe in nonsense or mock the tradition for teaching nonsense. Quote, and if you are one of these two groups, he says, then don't, paraphrasing, don't read me any further. However, the third group sees the layers and nuances of language, especially language that philosophers use. Such persons distinguish themselves from their literalist compatriots by an appreciation for parables and riddles, the preferred literary genre of the biblical and rabbinic traditions. They acknowledge that, quote, all men of wisdom speak of the ultimate and lofty matters only by way of chidat mashal, of parable and riddle. This is a fundamental principle of those who are, quote, masters of language, who are aware that in esoteric topics there is a pshat, uh, at a sod, or an interior and exter external, Zahir and Batan, what is unique to the third is precisely the talent of finding acceptable words. 
which is cited actually one more time in the introduction to the Yud Gimel Karim. Quote, and if you belong to this third group, whenever you encounter something that is intellectually unacceptable, ponder it to discover it is a different kind of language, a chidah mashal, concern yourself to find acceptable words. This is again in the introduction to the, uh, in the Perish Mishnayot uh, to the Yud Gimel Karim. Maimonides' philosophical disciples are those who mimic Solomon's linguistic methodology. Maimonides' characterization of scriptural language is most aptly captured by his adoption of a rabbinic hermeneutical maxim that Dibrat Torah kilashon b'nei adam. The Torah speaks in the language of human beings. Maimonides draws on a rabbinic principle that actually originally distinguished a certain approach to biblical language, identified with a school, <coughs> which actually restricted its interpretive scope with regard to halakha. That is, you can't really interpret every single word because that's the way people speak. However, Maimonides transforms it into a strategy of reading which appreciates biblical language as a popular means of communication. At the same time, it covers or allows a vista of philosophical possibilities. What this implies for him is that there is a stark dichotomy between the Torah's true, sublime, abstract, and universal ideas and the deceptively mundane, crude, and parochial means by which it communicates them. Maimonides reconfigured what for the rabbis had been an exegetically conservative approach that constrained rabbinic interpretive latitude with respect to biblical language into one that nurtures interpretive expansiveness to liberate truth, esoteric truth, from its mundane articulation. Language, Lashon, lies at the very core of Maimonides' exegetical project. Though contemporary scholarship tends to alienate Maimonides the philosopher from Maimonides the halakhist, and now we're beginning to see the cracks um, with um, essays like Aviram's, he remains consistent on the centrality he assigns to the enterprise of probing language in his halakha. The Mishnah Torah, after all, his comprehensive legal code, opens peculiarly for a work that is a legal code, or that purports to be a legal code. It commences with a book titled Book of Knowledge, which begins by identifying the very first commandments it, to believe in the existence of God and the unity of God, and the greater part of that first chapter is concerned with the subtle art of reading scripture. Presenting a virtual digest, if you look through that first chapter in Mishnah Torah, of all the problematic terms descriptive of God that are dealt with in the guides lexicography. It really kind of, there's an interlocking um, exegesis, or, or, or it's a symbiotic re relationship between the Mishnah Torah and um, the guide. All of them, whether they indicate features of a divine physiognomy, Emotions, attributes, are kinuyim, mashal, mishalim, melitza, metaphors, parables, figures of speech. So the entire first chapter is concerned with language. The task of the Jewish reader mm -hmm. is to make his scriptures speak explicitly as asserted in the Mishnah Torah, the Furash. Clearly, reading scripture from Maimonides is a liberating venture for both the text and its reader. It allows meaning to escape the pragmatic, pragmatic constraints of human language whose linguistic reach only extends, in quoting <coughs> the Mishnah Torah here, Dark and lowly physical bodies that dwell in houses of clay, and whose foundations are in the dirt. As Maimonides' citation of this last Jobian verse infers, it also reminds the reader of his own inferior state vis-a-vis -vis the grandeur of the, of the universe. At the same time, the term clay, or chomer, the standard Hebrew term for matter as opposed to form in the medieval Jewish philosophical lexicon, conjures up that aspect of the lowly existence that the reader must overcome by the exercise of his form, his nobler dimension, his tzelem, his intellect, if he aspires to cultivate his humanity and find common ground between himself and God. If a reading doesn't penetrate the external, if it doesn't discern the tabuchei zahav from the maskiot keset, then existence itself will be mired in the chomer, 
that renders it indistinguishable from animal or unreflective existence. He will then end life as the following verse in Eov, condemn him, Yamutu velo bechachma, he will die without wisdom. The allusion to Job also draws wisdom into a legal code whose ultimate purpose is to present a legal system that best preserves the wisdom whose absence from the introductory description of Job's character, that is, Job is described as an ishtam, the ashar, but he's missing chachma in the guy, as a key to the book. His halachic work also then is anchored in problems and issues of language. So um, now I just wanted to address so those were a few words about the centrality of language in his whole project. Um, and now I want to address the question that uh, Aviram ended off with, which is the question um, not whether it necessitates, but does, hal does halakha enable, does it enable um, a philosophical shaping of halakha? So the handout that I gave you is, is a, a kind of a classic source. Uh, Aviram mentions it uh, in terms of Tversky, uh, an argument between Tversky and Harvey on how to, how to, uh, how to uh, kind of approach this problem. But I want to add something to it, and that is in Hilchot Bikurim. That is, um, sorry? Oh. <laughs> Give me another minute. <laughs> I needed all of them. Um, so um, there is a, um, a, a, a ruling in the Mishnah that is an undisputed ruling, or a stum Mishnah, um, that says that a convert um, cannot recite the doxology, uh, that kind of little prayer, or whatever you want to call it, that accompanies the bringing of the first fruits. The bringing of the first fruits. Elu mevin v'lo korin, that's the Mishnah. Hager mevi the eno korin, the convert uh, brings the Bikurim, but he can't, he can't read it because he can't, consider himself part of the prayer, part of the historical consciousness that this prayer uh, raises. That is, this is the land that was promised to our forefathers. After all, the convert isn't biologically a descendant. However, Maimonides, in his, uh, in his commentary um, on the Mishnah, first of all, says, Gave ger mevi v'kore, shenemar la'avram hamon goyim nitaticha, that is, the ger, the convert, can consider himself a descendant of Abraham philosophically, notionally, because he has accepted the fundamental beliefs of Abraham, and therefore he is a ben. He is a ben. And this goes perfectly together with the term to give birth in the guide, in the guide, as that's source uh, four, I guess that's give three, whatever it is, whoever instructs an individual in some matter and teaches them an opinion has, as far as is being provided with this opinion concerned, as it were engendered that individual. So it goes perfectly together with giving birth to the gear is the child, is actually the child, perhaps according to the Rambam, more a child, more a child of uh, uh, a descendant of Abraham than naturally born Jews naturally born Jews who don't completely subscribe intellectually to the beliefs that Abraham led. In his Mishnah Torah, he rules um, that, um, uh, uh, that uh, the ger brings and, and recites. That is, in contravention of the Stam Mishnah. Now, we know, and it's one of the rare instances that give us a glimpse into Maimonides' reasoning, which is a, which clear here to me seems a clearly philosophical approach. That is, there is, there is, and here's where Aviram is right, the halacha enables Maimonides to uh, present a ruling that contravenes a stum Mishnah, because there is a Yerushalmi. There, there is a ruling in the Palestinian Torah. And the Igeret, the famous letter to the convert, which is called an Igeret, but it, it's really a tshuva. I mean, it's, it's a tshuva. It's clearly a tshuva. There he cites the Rishalmi um, as being the basis for allowing the convert to say all kinds of things, including the, um, the doxology that accompanies the Bikurim. Now, um, there is a problem, and this is what I, what I want to, that, that this shows, I think, 
that when he, when halacha enables him to, philosophy will jump in and shape the halacha as it did in Bikurim. But there is a directly contradictory halacha, which, is, which involves the exact same thing, which is with the tithing, the tithing of the second tithe, Master Shani, which also requires a, an accompanying recitation, where Maimonides, and this is the back of, of your sources, Maimonides rules that that Now he quotes a different different thing, but clearly the same the same reasoning could have applied. That is, after all, the Gair, the convert, is notionally, philosophically a descendant of Avraham, and yet he rules in a completely contradictory way and I'm, of course, not the first to notice this. This has exercised rabbinic authorities ever since the Rambam came on the scene. Um, and I have here, um, I have here one example of an answer, but the tortuous ways they try to harmonize the two simply highlight the problem. Simply highlight the problem. So I have one here from, I'm glad that somebody preceded me, that you preceded me with Girsa the Yankasa, so I could say, in the Igris Moshe, because I don't think anybody in that world would call it Igrot Moshe. So he says, uh, and, and there are others, that is, that in the Hilkot Mikurim, in that recitation, it says that God promised uh, that there was an oak made to Abraham, Latet Lanu, to give us. Meaning it's, it's cast in the future sense. And in the future, all converts will have a chilek in the land. Whereas uh, here in uh, Maser, it's asher natata one that gave us. So therefore, and, and there, there are a number of these. There are six or seven that I found. But that simply highlights exactly your point. Because in the rabbinic circles, they're constrained to think this way, but they can't think that there is somehow a philosophical consideration. So the contradiction simply highlights the fact that there was a philosophical consideration that shaped the law, his ruling, in Bikurim. In Bikurim. So um, I'd like to thank you all again and thank Aviram for pointing out this very fascinating uh, issue. Thank you.